Yeah, so the new record comes out on July 14th. Uh, so what can you tell fans about The Unknown? Um, I There's a lot to say, but um, I'd say this album is us taking a look at everything we've done and looking at the tempos we've never explored, the um, tunings we've never explored, and we just had a lot of fun really we we've done we've done everything from thrash to ballads to mid paced stuff if you listen through our older albums we've we've done slow stuff already it's just on this one we just wanted to explore it a bit more so you're just hearing us experimenting we're still evile it's just at different speeds <laughs> yeah it's it's really cool because especially with the the two singles that are out now you can totally hear like an evolution in your sounds, you know? And I feel like with a lot of bands, they're all trying to like, you know, they're very worried about what are the fans going to think of this? What are the fans going to think of that? I feel like with you guys, you know, it's all about like from the heart. It's very like what you guys like. Have that, has that always been the the songwriting process and the, the mindset for you? Yeah, 100%. It's, um, it's not a cliche. It's, I genuinely don't care what people think of the music because with the first thing we do is write the songs to the point that we're happy with them so if there's anything about any song even if it's one bar of a song and like ben's like i don't like that we work on it until everyone's happy and it's always been that way even when we jammed the first album songs in, in the rehearsal room up to right now where i plant the seed of the riff and then work on the song it's I'm never thinking, oh, people might not like that because you can't think like that or you, you get trapped and you can't please everyone. So we just please ourselves. And if other people like it, it's great. If not, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. That's cool to hear from you. So how much has the songwriting process changed from Enter the Grave? Like quite a lot? Not much. Not, oh, really? The only thing that's changed is we were young we had no responsibilities. We could always go to the rehearsal room, play together and jam together. And then, you know, the older you get, there's people have responsibilities that change and girlfriends, kids, and it just fell into my lap initially. So I, I, I became obsessed with writing and playing. So the second album, it was like, I wanted to get write the best album we could. So, I was always there on Pro Tools, recording on my laptop everywhere. And it was just sharing what I was writing with the rest of the band. And then they'd have input or say, that sucks, so that's great. And it's just developed into that now. It's it's pretty much, it starts with one riff. And well, before it would, we'd be jamming in a room and we'd build it together and be like, oh, this is so cool. And logistically, we just couldn't do that always. You know, everyone's got jobs and everything. So just went onto Pro Tools instead and just recording ideas. And then when I get to a cool part in a song, I'll send the rest of the, that song to the band and be like, do you like it? And then we'll work on it together. Like on this album, Adam sent a few riffs in. Uh, the song Monolith wouldn't exist without Adam because the main riff is his. Wow. Um, beginning of the end, the bass line is Ben's, so it exists because of Ben. So it's quite democratic, but it's, it's a lot of me being up till three, four in the morning with the kids asleep on the floor below me, just, <laughs> just obsessing, really obsessing. But yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, what's cool about like modern day uh, songwriting is like you can do that now. You know what I mean? You don't have to meet up with people. You can just send people a, a drive link on Messenger or something. Hey, yeah. this is what I got. It's so so easy I mean, now. Don't get me wrong. We still do go to the rehearsal room and jam the songs so they feel right because. If you just do it on Pro Tools and then go to the studio, you might get there and think, ah, it doesn't actually work. Like it works to listen to, but to feel it's it's not always the same. So it always helps to do that as well. Cool. Yeah. So it's like finding that nice balance between jamming and, you know, recording something on Pro Tools at like three in the morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool, cool. Well, uh, I, I'm digging the the singles that are out i love the unknown so much um so it's about like the anxieties of like fatherhood and whatnot how personal are these lyrics do you vary because i know you you became a father 
as of recent? No, it was um, 2017. Our first first child. Um, okay, wow. So yeah, it's very personal. Um, when I wasn't in the band, I, I wrote some lyrics down be- doing with this, and um, when it came to this album, and it, knowing that it wasn't going to be about demons and war and all that, um, I wanted to do it more personal. <laughs> I remembered that I had that idea, so I went back to those lyrics, but I think every song on the album, except Sleepless Eyes, because Joel wrote it, is really personal to me because I was just fed up of singing about demons. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, fair enough. (laughs) Wow, so so this has kind of been floating in your head for a while then. That song, yeah, the the lyrics, but um, the last album, we you know, it was our our comeback. So I just wanted to it to be the most aggressive, fastest, most brutal album. And then this time around, it was I don't like to. Well, we don't like doing the same thing twice. So we just thought. Hell Unleash was 85 percent thrash, 15 percent chug. And we thought, let's just do the polar opposite. Let's just flip it on its head. Let's do tempos we've not explored. And then still have thrashing. There's still thrash on the album. There's still mid pace. There's there's even a ballad, which we haven't done since 2013. Mm. So th- there's everything on there. It's, it's people just hear five seconds of something and think, oh, you've sold out. Blah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's what's like rough, especially some of like the the like hardcore like thrash metal fans. I feel like are just so in their head about what a certain band's supposed to sound like. But what a band, is, it's like, you know, you're projecting your emotions and what you want something to sound like. You're not trying mm. to please some guy, you know, who who yeah. knows exactly what thrash metal is supposed to sound like, apparently. But it's you really were, cool. Were... Yeah, it, I'm just saying it's, it's, it's cool to see um, you guys, like, really have emotional lyrics and, and really put yourselves out there. As a fan... It, it almost makes me feel like I'm more connected with you guys now, you oh, know, cool. Thank and, and there you. might be, you know, someone in that, that stage of like, you know, the unknown, not knowing what fatherhood's going to be that might mm. connect to this song and, and might feel a little better. So it, it must feel great for yeah, you guys. It is. I, I've already had a lot of people message me say, like, I know exactly what you, you went through. Um, and the song just instantly resonated with me and it's, it re- it means a lot to hear stuff like that. Yeah, that's awesome. How uh, how much has fatherhood fatherhood taught you personally? Quite a lot. <laughs> I'm guessing. Yeah. It's, yeah? it's um it, for lack of a better way of saying it, it completely changes you. Like your your priorities before having kids are nowhere near what your priorities are after having kids like it you just become a different person because the things that were important before are not so important anymore and everything's about keeping them safe and bringing them up right and you know like before if i went on tour we did five months touring in north america in 2010 and i loved it it was awesome i don't remember much of it <laughs> but now if i'm away for a week i'm thinking god I'm, i really miss my kids and if if you told me that in 2010 i'd be like no that's not metal no that doesn't sound right <laughs> but yeah it just changes a lot of things but it's great it's, it is really great yeah it's I, I guess it's nothing you can really truly prepare for you know no no you, you can read as many books as you want but it's all learning every day yeah, I, I I also didn't know that um, babies can shoot number two at you. <laughs> no one, no one told Projectile me Projectile number two. Yes, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, are we gonna hear that on one of the the new songs at all? As one of the, what, the sound of projectile. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> might be a little metal, you know. I don't know. That's pretty metal, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what is metal though is uh, Napalm Records. It's really cool. You guys are with them. I love them as a label. So, uh, so what's yeah. your relationship like with Napalm? It's really good. I, I have no complaints at all. They're a really good label. They're really on the ball. Emails back and forth all the time. Ideas accepted and given. Just really good. Like, I, I have nothing better to say. They're, they're a really good label. Really friendly. Really nice. 
That's really awesome to hear because there's so many people I talk to who will talk about labels and be like, yeah, they controlled everything we did, you know, and it's just yeah, horror no. stories, you know? So that's really cool that like, you know, I feel like it's a trend that like labels nowadays are way more, you know, there's so much more freedom. So that's really cool, you know, that you guys have complete freedom to really do what you want in terms of like songwriting and have a really awesome label backing you at the same yeah. time. I think my experience mainly with Near Farm is as long as they like the music, they just let you do what you want, you know, and as long as you're not completely changing your style and going down a wrong road, they'll be like, oh, well, this isn't, they'd be like, well, this isn't Eva, really, is it? So <laughs> just the fact they like it, that's, they're happy, you know? Yeah, a good balance, you know, is always yeah. healthy. Um, yeah. So I love your songwriting and I'm just curious. So what are some of your like personal musical inspirations that you pull um, from? it's hard to um it's hard to attach my inspirations to what i write because what i listen to isn't anywhere close to like what you hear now like i love listening to frank sinatra cool uh yes um gentle giant um e even well death metal there's some death metal in eva but um <laughs> yeah i Whenever I write, I only write what I play. So when I write a riff, it comes from what I grew up playing, which was Metallica, obviously. Testament, Sepultura, all that. Um, but a lot of my influence does come from what I mentioned, like even structurally, I can hear a Frank Sinatra song and think, that would be cool in a metal song. I mean, like, <laughs> structurally, something happens. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. I'll try that in a in a song. So... It comes so from everywhere. Cool. It's hard to decipher, really. I, I can, what I usually do is I write a part of a song and then I put it on in my car while I'm driving to work and I will listen to this 300 times or so until something clicks and I'll be like, right, I know exactly what needs to come next. Or I'll hear something that I don't like and think, right, delete, go back, re-record it, listen another 300 times. <laughs> <laughs> cool wow very interesting that's that's cool the the sinatra stuff i love uh i love sinatra gentle giant also like that nice. vertigo press of it oh so mm -hmm. awesome uh so good. no the really cool to hear um and it's awesome that you guys are putting out like kick-ass thrash metal in 2023 um I, i'm just curious what your thoughts are on like modern thrash metal you know, this this genre has such an extensive timeline now, I feel like, you know, there's so much thrash metal still coming out. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on where it it is now. I I think it's doing great. I mean, bands like, well, you've got Havoc and Warbringer, bands like that, really good. You've even got younger bands, there's a band in the UK called Tortured Demon, um, just... It, it's really healthy. The, my my only issue with modern thrash is it's not taken seriously enough by a lot of people. Like I I understand though. When I was younger, I was just all about Metallica. Anything else sucked. You know, I didn't even <laughs> listen to it. I just thought I'm not listening to that band because it's not Metallica. It'll suck. And it's that mentality in in thrash and metal that sometimes people just don't give it the time of day like most people have probably just heard thrashed about eval and thought retro thrash don't don't want to listen to it but like Th thrasher is the only song we've done that's like way thrash metal head banging <laughs> like, after that we didn't do anything else that was like that so uh, i just i wish people would give the new thrash bands more of a chance i'm not saying that for eval i mean all of them i, I see it quite a lot of just like retro thrash just ripping off the 80s it's like come on it's it's a style of music like people still write classical music they aren't saying oh i, I only listen to beethoven exclusively it's like it's you know it's still popular now so yeah <laughs> it is it totally is and, and thrash metal's more than just the 80s you know yeah it's it is a very serious genre of music and to see it evolve, and I feel like fans need to be more open about it and give it a chance to like grow a little more. 
Yeah, I, you know I love I mean? when we play a gig and a guy who's in like his late 40s, late 50s comes up and says, I saw Metallica in 92 or Megadeth and I haven't been to a gig that made me feel like that until now since then and that that really means a lot to me because those are the guys who were there they're not just on the internet 21 but like oh <laughs> news right so they're the guys who were there who get it and they get the feel and the the atmosphere of it that's that's what we enjoy so that always means a lot that's really cool that's awesome um now you know evil you guys have been going for a long time now um and it's really cool to see your discography and look at it as a, a thing, you know? And, and there's so much that's changed since the early days of the band. Do you remember the first show you ever played as Evile? Do you remember how that went? Um, it, it's hard to pin down because we started as a Metallica tribute band called Metal Militia. And we did that for maybe three years or something. But we started putting in our own songs like i think killer from the deep was the first song we started putting into the metallica set and we noticed it was going down better than the metallica songs so <laughs> i can't remember when we said we aren't metal militia anymore we're evil but i remember the first metal militia gig was in a town called halifax in the uk it was like a I think it was something that schools had put together so there was all these kids that arrived from their school and you know the, the the kind of thing where they haven't drunk before and they're getting wasted and they can't handle it and the, the most bizarre thing about the show was someone got a brick thrown at their head and there was blood all over the the men's toilets and which pretty metal yeah but, um, pretty brutal that's the, the first thing i i'd say is the first eval gig but wow maybe there was an eval song in there i don't know <laughs> maybe Wow, that's wild. Does the where does the name Evil come from? Is it it's, connected um, to Metallica at all? No, no. It was um it's a really boring story. I wish it was more interesting, but um Matt came up with the name Exile and we looked on the internet back in when was it like ninety nine when the internet barely worked <laughs> and there was like a hundred bands called exile all over the world and we just we can't do that so matt just said why don't we change the x to a v and then we googled <laughs> it there was one band in spain that hadn't done anything for a, quite a while so we said evil sounds good that's awesome <laughs> and there, still it, a cool piece of lore because it was it's evil evil and vile in one word which a lot of people don't realize it's just a word but evil and vile <laughs> So, yeah. yeah that is cool that is a cool story you know that, i don't feel oh, okay, like that was good. boring that was cool <laughs> cool piece of lore right there um <laughs> now uh now i'm just curious with the domination of vinyl now you know as you can see behind me i'm, I'm a big fan you know and and i feel oh, like wow, vinyl's yeah, I... awesome <laughs> yeah and this right. is just the some of it a little bit of it i i have a lot more i just love records and it's not like i even grew up with it or anything i i just love the sound of it i just love yeah. the whole ritual of putting on an album and stuff and I very recently understand. yeah very recently you know vinyl i, I actually I think it was been like a couple years since it outsold cds mm. and is like the the ultimate physical medium when you put together a track list on a record do you think of the vinyl at all of this is going to be the start of side B. This is going to end side A. Do you at all? Yes. Yeah, 100%. That, that's something um, our first label, Eric Records, the boss, Digby, that was something he inadvertently taught us. So he said, like, you have to think about if it's 10 songs, you've got to think the first five, then it's an end. Then the next five, they start again. So I... I don't aim for that, but it, it always helps when you think like, oh, this is the, the climax of side A, and then you're going to turn over and start again. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that th I think about. Cool. Does, how important is physical media to you at all? Are you more of a streaming guy? Do you? I, I'm 100% physical media for, for a few reasons. I grew up by going to a shop, buying a CD, you know, on the bus home, I'd get the booklet out, read the lyrics and take it all in. And 
just enjoy it. And I, I think it's, I'm not going to go too hippie, but <laughs> I think the, the, the layout and the aesthetic of the physical product helps how the album sounds because when I hear some music, I hear that I see the artwork and the, the, the products I had growing up still to now. And if, if I had that album and it was just a, a bootleg copy with like a white sheet, the, the music wouldn't hit as hard in my memory and psyche. I don't know, but I, I always have to have a physical copy of something that I love or else it's just, it's just hearing it and it, it helps so much for me. And the other reason is from a band performer point of view that people have no idea how much it helps a band when you buy a CD or a vinyl, like, yes, go to gigs, buy merch. That's great. But the physical product that you're selling is a completely different animal. And when it comes to record labels and money, the, a really good way to support a band is to buy the product because that without going into too much detail, that is how you pay off a band's debt to a label by buying a product. And that's the only way. So it really helps bands. So your favorite band buy their shit. A hundred percent. And and it's always good to hit that merch stand, even the, the yeah. physical vinyls too. There's something yeah. about putting the record on, looking at the cover, reading the insert, uh, I think adds so much more to the record because it puts a face, it puts an image on the music and it, it, it lets you connect with a band. So so that's really awesome. Now, I want to talk about some of the uh, the early records of Evil and to the grave. Do you remember what the uh, recording and writing process was like for that record? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. So the the best thing about the first album was most of the songs except I can't remember which ones now most of them were written already so we we didn't sit down and write an album it was all the things we just wrote together in the rehearsal room without a goal in mind it was just oh we're not doing Metallica covers anymore we're doing our own shit and it was fun and we just had no goal so when we got signed it was just a case of oh we've got to record the songs that we've already got oh wow and we we joked with the label do you reckon fleming rasmussen would record us ha 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 and then they replied with like let's let's see we we're like oh no 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 wait no we were joking <laughs> and he he replied saying yeah sounds great let's do it wow so the label were like right we're gonna fly you to uh denmark and record in sweet sound the studios so we got there there's like gold discs of metallica all down the the walls and we we're recording through the desk that lightning and puppets was recorded on. And honestly, it was, it was way too much to be doing all of a sudden. And it was a great experience though. We were there for like three or four weeks and just, yeah. One thing I remember is, um, tracking the guitars and like messing up and Fleming kept saying like, James wouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's really oh helping. my god <laughs> the, he's he's a bit of a yeah he's a bit like that <laughs> <laughs> that's funny man wow yeah. that's cool and, and must have just like playing like metal like just thrash metal in general before putting out your first record just doing all those shows must have taught you so much and must have really given you a head start as a band it you know did. doing yeah, that many we, gigs we when we properly started Eval, we started in like 2002, I, I'm going to say. And then we'd play gigs locally. And when I tell people this, they don't believe me. Thrash was not cool. Like we'd play gigs and people would laugh and they'd come up to us and say, why the hell are you playing Thrash? Like it's dead. It's stupid. And then a couple of years later, you know, Municipal Waste as well. All that started. Then we got signed. And then all of a sudden, Thrash is cool again. And those same people would come to the gigs like, dude, I was at your so-and-so gig a couple of years ago. You guys are so good. I was like, I distinctly remember you telling us that Thrash is stupid. Wow. <laughs> so, that, yes. that must be a great feeling. 
Hey, it was fun. I just, yeah. <laughs> but to see to see that change in Thrash was stupid to oh Thrash is cool again. Um I don't know, like it, it was just an interesting time, definitely. Yeah, wow. And it's and a lot of these bands had to go through the the like two thousands and late nineties of just that, you know, mm. that evolution of thrash where it was kind of that dead spot. So I'm I'm really glad you guys powered through that. As of a lot of bands, you know, um, yeah, yeah. so we were talking about like vinyl, a lot of physical media. So, so what are your thoughts on like this whole domination of streaming? It's pretty much taken over the music industry it's, completely. It's, it's a double-edged sword for me because I'll openly admit I use Spotify. I subscribe to Spotify because it's easy. They have everything. Um, but I'm fully aware that they pay artists like shit. It's like it's not point not 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 three cents a play or something, and then you've got to split that between the label or the publisher or blah blah blah. So it's even less than that, and it's it's just not fair to be honest. I, I'm not I'm not complaining I'm like oh, it's not fair, <laughs> but it's you know it, they should be pay, paid fairly. It's you get a million plays on Spotify, it's something like three thousand pounds or something. It's just Mm. it doesn't add up that to me i mean yeah it's just I, I think artists are quite undervalued in the eyes of streaming and I, I and paying them so unfairly perpetuates that low value of of artistry so i i think i don't something needs to change i don't know i don't know the solution well, you're you're a hundred percent correct on that because you know you guys at least like you people you're selling tickets to shows you know you are finding forms of income. The thing is, some of these smaller bands, you know, Spotify's all they have. Yeah, you know, exactly. So well, it's we're the like, same. We're, we're we're kind of. I'm not saying we're a small band, but I'm not saying we're a big band. We're still at the point where, you know, we're working full time, and we have to accept that eval is a hobby. So I, I wish we could earn a living off the doing eval, but I'm, I'll be the first to openly admit that we all work full time and we, we can't do that for, um, music full time. I wish we could. And I wish more bands would be honest about it, that they work full time to highlight the fact that music needs to be more valued. And I wish it was, I, I wish we could tour more like, going to your employer and saying oh can i have three months off I, no <laughs> you can't <laughs> I, I wish it was yeah wish it was a bit better for artists to tour and stuff yeah i i agree too and even like that band tanker they've all had like full-time jobs yeah <laughs> like their whole career too and it's what like wild really wild and, and it's, i'm glad you are saying something about it um because a lot of people will brush over and be like yeah we're fine you know everything's good <laughs> But no, I think it is an issue, and I, I and fans like on, want bands to like make a living off their stuff. Yeah. It's you like know? on on a on an artist's Facebook profile, it's like guitarist at so and so band. It's like yeah, but you're not. You're also, <laughs> you're also working full time at so and so. It's yeah, like, so come on. The mystique has kind of died with the internet, you know. So come yeah. On. <laughs> well, well, you do have you have uh, several forms of income. You also have the YouTube channel as well you've been doing that for like 16 years now which yeah. is pretty awesome uh so what really made you cool. want to like pursue that like um, a youtube channel i i use my youtube channel i i, I don't get monetized I, I i have no income from youtube um it's just kind of for fun like i, I stream on twitch when i when i can it's hard with kids and work <laughs> but um i try and get it at least once a week um but again i can't do it to the point where well, i wish i could stream full time that would be great but it's too much of a gamble to leave your job to play guitar on the internet is like <laughs> do it for two months and like the kids will be like we, we need some food <laughs> <laughs> yeah apparently kids are expensive i've heard yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is cool. And I like seeing it as a fan, like, you know, you're kind of going to your roots, you know, with the like Metallica covers, you know, covering Exodus and all, all the bands you love. 
Um, and it's yeah. really cool seeing you on Twitch stream and like talk to talk to fans and like really interact with people. You even did a Q&A recently I saw, which was really cool. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I try and do them every stream. Just it, it's to be honest, it's just to have a break from the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> how how much of an impact do you feel like Twitch has had on Evil? Um, I'd say it's had some. I mean, over COVID is when I you know I saw Matthew uh, Hafey from Trivium doing it. I would I was just curious how you do that, and I just got talking to some people, got doing it, and I think that kind of kept. The eval thing alive a bit more because you know no one could perform or anything and and i didn't want eval to stream a live concert because i don't know it, at the time it was like not our thing we'd rather play a venue to people instead of playing to a, a webcam you know so it, it did help the eval thing kind of stay there but it, it's all about live for us mm. Yeah, and I know a lot of bands did that over COVID, you know, mm. where they're like, we'll just play in a basement. But I feel like the the fun about watching a concert is the the pit, seeing everyone yeah. go crazy, you know, feeding off that energy. It um, is. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, me and um, a few friends went to see Pantera two nights ago in Berlin. We flew there just to see it, then come back. And again, the thing about being at a a gig you have so many people on the internet commenting like oh it's not really pantera it's not dimebag and a small amount of me agreed until i was there and i remembered like it's none of this is about the internet or comments it's about being there and as soon as i was there the atmosphere the sound and everything it was one of the best gigs i've ever been to wow regardless really? of who's there it was just mind-blowing i wow. highly recommend going to see them if you can yeah, I'm seeing them open for uh, Metallica on their like two year tour or whatever. Um, yeah, which you, I'm, you I'm excited. It. I'm excited for to see Pantera. You know, I've like again, like I was born in '98, so that train passed a long time ago for me. But yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm very excited to see them. So I'm glad. You know, if 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 you liked it, that's that's the only uh, thing I need to hear. The friend friend I was with, a guy called Dave, he plays in a band called Pissed. Uh, he saw um, Pantera back in the day, and even he said, "Like, man, that that's a contender for wow. being better than back then." Honestly, he it was just I can't even explain it. It was very good. Wow. Well, now I'm extra excited. So yeah. <laughs> that's awesome, man. That's really cool to hear. Um, that's cool. And and we're talking about like you know shows and stuff. Uh, you guys have done plenty of shows. Is there a, are there any? you know places that you would love to tour that you haven't yet um yeah we'd love to get to australia uh japan south america is somewhere we've only been to colombia last year we played um yeah it was colombia summer breeze festival no no that's germany i i can't remember what, what we've played <laughs> But yeah, South America is somewhere we've always tried to go, and it's always fallen through. And it's it's like it's it's money versus the opportunity. So sometimes you need to be invited to places, and we have so many messages saying, "You know, come to Argentina, come to Brazil," and it's it's not that simple. So people spreading the word really helps. You know, just sharing to their friends, like, "Oh, check this band out," and. Yeah, mm. those are the places I really want to go. But yeah. everywhere, I want to go everywhere. I want to go back to North <laughs> America again because, again, we did five months there and I miss it. I really miss it over there. Yeah, I would love to see you guys. Um, I've yet to see one of your shows, so it's on my bucket list. Um, I'm looking forward to it next time you visit. It just sucks with finances now. Even like yeah. recently, Anthrax had to pull out of a European tour. Megadeth couldn't even do Australia because of the cost yeah. so it's like it, it's really crazy how we, how, we looked, how much it affects bands we looked at doing north america this with the end of the year that's just gone and once we started adding everything up it was just like well we can't we, we simply can't like the the return that we would get versus the what we put in is just in the red 
there's, there's mm. zero point to do it. So until things get better, I have no idea how things are going to go. Yeah. Would that change for like a, maybe a festival or a, yeah. Yeah. Like it's way easier. I, I'd love to play a Milwaukee metal fest that, um, mm. hate breed, uh, Jamie's re resurged. Research? No. Um, and then like maybe put a few shows around there to like make it make sense. But we're, we're just, we're trying everything we can. What What's the best way for fans to keep in touch with e and just everything you're doing? Um, follow us on Spotify. Uh, we're on Instagram, all that crap. Um, buy, buy the CDs, the vinyls, um, you know, we're, we're openly contactable. Like people can message us on anything and you will likely get a, a message back. Uh, I'm on cameo as well. I'm on Twitch. Uh, every, just search evil, evilcult.com everywhere. Really cool. The unknown July 14th. Thank you so much, man, for doing this. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank uh, you for having me. Thank you. Of course. I'm Brandon Baddock and this is disturbing the priest.